So we're in week three of this series called Habits for Love, and a, a fundamental conviction of this series is that if we are going to grow in the way of love, if we're going to grow in loving God and dwelling in God's love and truly loving others, it's not going to be enough to just get right ideas in our heads, but we're going to have to practice in our bodies and in our schedules and in our habits the way of Jesus. And this fall, we've been focusing on this very important biblical theme of rest. We saw two weeks ago as we looked at the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2 how the the goal of creation, the goal of your life is rest. That is to rejoice in God who is king, to rest in him, to savor him. We've been doing this project is what we've been calling it of habits for love and so the last couple weeks we've suggested that maybe we try to detox a bit, where we have suggested different ways that we might uh, slow down, that we might abstain from certain habits of busyness and and entertainment and speed to create some space. I'm just wondering that, uh, curious, how is that going? What, What have you noticed, those of you who have, you know, tried something, what have you noticed one of my goals uh, in, in, for me in this has been to try to seek more wholeness in my life. So we've put some limits on things like TV, and we've sought to, uh, in our house, resist the temptation to just always grab for the phone. I've wanted to try and be wholly present whatever I'm doing. If I'm working, I want to be wholly present in work. If I'm with my kids, I want to be wholly present with them. Um, Jeff gave the challenge last week in his little YouTube short, if you've been following those, about putting your your phone on grayscale, which I took that challenge, and uh, wondering if anyone else has tried it, what your experience has been. Maybe someday I'll go back to color, but right now I have to say I'm kind of loving it. Uh, Google Maps is terrible because you can't tell what the colors are, so red doesn't look red, so that's a little confusing. But other than that, I used to get on my phone and, you know, I'd open my email because I wanted to check some, some email that I thought I was going to get. And all of a sudden, ooh, oh, it's so colorful. It's so, it's so bright. Oh, there's this, there's this car ad or, there, or there's these new shoes. Or, and now it's just boring. It's so boring. And as I think about what we're doing in this series, I think so much of this is about attention. We've said this before and, and we've seen this before in Scripture that worship is about attention. That if we're going to worship and enjoy God, you, you have to focus your attention on who God is, on what God has said, on what God has done. Just like if you want to go deeper in a relationship with someone, if you want to get to know them in a deeper way, whether we're talking about like a friend or a child or your spouse, you have to give your attention. You can't be distracted. Don't try and multitask on a date, right? You have to listen. You have to slow down. You have to look in the other person's eyes. You have to just be with them. The passage that we just had read is very much about attention. It's about slowing down and attending to Jesus. It's about turning from distraction, from busy and and anxious life, uh, this feeling pulled apart and stressed, turning toward Jesus and focusing our attention on Him. This is a passage about what it means to receive Jesus and be a disciple of Jesus, to learn from Him, to be transformed by Him as, as the healing and wholeness and fullness of His redemptive power comes into your life. This is a passage that contrasts one way of life with another way of life. We could say the way of Martha and the way of Mary. And there's probably a lot that we could observe in this account, but I want us to consider three contrasts that I think will be helpful to us. And so these three areas that we're going to consider this morning are, first, how we relate to cultural values Second, how we relate to ourselves. And then finally, where we give our attention. 
So first, how, how we relate to cultural values. Uh, look with me at the text. If you don't have it out, that'd be really helpful to have it out. Uh, we read in Luke 10, verse 38, now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. That phrase, welcomed him into her house, is important. It's, it's one word in Greek, and it refers to this very important practice, both biblically and culturally, of hospitality. It shows up a few times in the New Testament, one later in Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 19. If you remember the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, uh, this man who was sinful and, and not loved by his community and had done uh, bad things for sure, and Jesus shows him friendship and welcome, and he responds by welcoming Jesus into his house. In James chapter 2, James uses the same word to talk about what Rahab did in the story of Joshua in the Old Testament. Rahab was this prostitute who lived in the city of Jericho, and she showed hospitality and welcome to the spies of Israel, and her house was saved because of it. So this is a big deal. So far, so good. But verse 39 and 40, we see this contrast between the way of Martha and the way of Mary. Verse 39, and she, Martha, had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. The, there are few things more important in the first century Jewish world than hospitality. Hospitality. It was an important cultural value. And what Martha is doing in this text, it, this is completely normal, and it's exactly what her culture would say that she should be doing. Everybody knows this. And what Mary is doing is weird. In fact, it's worse. It's inappropriate. In addition to the extreme importance of hospitality, there were specific ideas about gender roles and, and what spaces even were considered appropriate if you were a man or a woman. Martha is nailing it. And Mary is not only not nailing it, she is sitting at the Lord's feet. That's a posture of a disciple which in the first century was viewed as this distinctly male role. In Acts 22, Paul talks about how previously in his life he was a disciple of Gamaliel, the famous rabbi, and he says he was educated at his feet. You see in this passage this, this theme of lordship where three times in three verses, starting in verse 39, Jesus is referred to as Lord. And one of the contrasts between the way of Martha and the way of Mary is that with Mary, the values of her culture have been relativized and transformed by the lordship of Jesus. Hospitality is good. Serving is good. But there is a greater good practicing discipleship, slowing down and attending to Jesus. If we were to think about our own culture, there are just so many things that we could list about what our culture values. But certainly in the western suburbs, we value career advancement, getting ahead, achieving. And that can be a good thing, but that has to be relativized and put in proper place under the lordship of Jesus. In the western suburbs, we, we value things that help our kids to grow and experience achievement and success, and that can be really great. But what happens when the career and the activities so fill up life that there's no time for Jesus? And what happens when, you know, right, the games are scheduled on Sunday and, and when the ACT or SAT prep and the, and the college prep for the big exam is scheduled on a Sunday morning? And what happens when life becomes so busy that we don't have time for community and relationship with the church? What happens when we don't have time to sit at Jesus' feet and learn from him? In our culture, like in the first century, there are going to be patterns to the life of someone who is attending to Jesus that's just going to be weird and maybe even offensive. I mean, think about it, right? Being busy is a cultural value. There, there's nothing that says being busy is good, but we just know it is, 
we feel good about being busy. We probably feel shame, or at least we don't talk about it very much, if our life is simple and slow, right? No one brags that they got 10 hours of sleep last night. But how many times have, have you or someone that you know, you, you, you know, the, I don't know, the humble brag or, or whatever, said something about like, oh man, my life is so crazy, work is so crazy, just we got so many projects going and like, oh, I'm on like five hours of sleep right now, just crushing it, right? Like it feels important, but what happens if we lose the ability to slow down and attend to Jesus? Is there anything that you could gain that would be worth losing that. Yes, Martha, serving others is important. Hospitality is important. If you read the Gospel of Luke, it is a significant theme. But even this is relativized and transformed by the supreme importance of sitting at Jesus' feet and giving your attention to Him. The second area of contrast that I want us to think about is, is how we relate to ourselves. Martha, very preoccupied with herself. And this is really kind of like one of the comical parts of this episode, because if Martha was being a really good host, and and she was, you know, seeking to be hospitable, everything would be about the guest. Yet if you look at what she says to Jesus, everything is still very much about Martha. We hear this me language three times. Verse 40, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. She calls Jesus Lord, but she's not really treating him like her Lord. She wants him to do what she wants. Martha, we see, she's very caught up in Martha. And Mary is very caught up in Jesus. It's really easy to put ourselves at the center of our own stories, isn't it? And we've talked about this some in Sunday school and in other places, but in our modern world filled with digital devices, I mean, this is just reinforced a thousand times over. When our daily experience digitally is all about us, right, news feeds curated to my preferences and affirming what I think, Selfies that I post after 57 pictures and I pick the one where the smile is just right. Algorithms and ads generated by my clicking, my search history, my likes that just keeps putting in front of me exactly what I want to see. The constant ability to distract myself and entertain myself with whatever I want. How will I not basically think that I'm at the center? And one of the challenges, obviously, with this is it's precognitive. Like, it's not even like an intellectual argument that we're having about what's at the center of life. It's just the way life feels. It just feels like I'm the most important person. And so, obviously, what I think and what I believe and what I feel and what I want is just right. And this is one of the reasons why this, what we're doing right now, is really important. Each week when we gather together for worship, we have the opportunity to communally practice giving our attention to Jesus, focusing our lives on Jesus, seeing our stories in light of His story and who Jesus is. Each week when we come together, the way one writer put it so well, we are graciously displaced from being the center of our story. As the Holy Spirit lifts our eyes off of ourselves to consider Jesus and we are incorporated into the story of God. Sometimes going to church doesn't feel like it's making much difference. And this could probably be true for all sorts of people in all sorts of different situations. There's always something else that you could be doing on a Sunday morning. I mean, if if you're a parent, I kind of already hinted at this, right? There's always the temptation of things competing with Sunday. But then there's the actual church experience. Like, there's no way that I am as entertaining as the million other things that you could be doing right now. It's okay to acknowledge with a laugh. That's that's true. Um, There's no way that this is as exciting as what you could be doing right now. You should feel a little FOMO right now. You are missing out on something by being here. And I'm sure parents, like, at times you feel this And kids, perhaps you feel this, like, 
am I even getting anything out of this? Is, are they getting anything out of this? And at times, the American church, I think, has, great, has greatly erred by responding to this sort of thing, by trying to be more entertaining, by, you know, the pastor as stand-up comedian, more excitement, more flashy. What if what we needed wasn't entertainment or excitement, but we actually needed to learn to slow down? What if church being a bit more boring than other things in our life was actually a feature and not a bug. That it was actually part of the point to slow us down and turn us from ourselves. What if learning how to slow down and and participate in worship on Sunday morning, right? Singing songs together where I can't just click next. I don't like that song. I'm changing it. Learning how to hear sermons and listen to sermons coming forward and receiving the elements. What if these practices, sometimes maybe a little boring, certainly repetitive, and these rather ordinary things, what if that's actually what we needed to learn to give our attention to Jesus? I mean, wouldn't we expect, given what we know of life, that this would be hard? That like coming here would be kind of a battle? That it would be a contested space and time? This week, I uh, asked my kids, um, is it sometimes hard to pay attention to church? <laughs> what might help you? And the response I got was actually really helpful. Um, what, what, one of them said, it helps if we've looked at the sermon text before I hear the sermon. Well, that's a great idea. We can do that. That's easy. So, you know what? You can do that too. Like, uh, the service is uploaded, I believe, on Friday, so you can go on Trinity's uh, homepage, trinityhinsdale.com, worship with us, and there it is, the PDF. What if you, or if you, you, you know, you by yourself, or you and some friends, or if you have kids and a family, you and your kids, you started the practice of reading the passage that's going to be preached on Sunday, maybe on Friday night or Saturday night or Saturday afternoon, whenever. What if you looked at the songs that we were going to sing and you just began to compile a playlist in Spotify or Apple Music so that when you're driving to the soccer game or to the piano practice, like we're listening to these songs that we're going to then sing together. What if on Sunday afternoon or evening you decided to adopt the practice of actually discussing with somebody else? Again, if, if you're a parent, maybe you have a time as a family where you say, we're all going to just go around and say, what was one thing that you know, we kind of remembered from the service today? Maybe it was one thing from the sermon, one verse, one idea, one application. We're going to all just share one thing and then we're going to pray. In a world of me, we need to be graciously displaced from being the center and caught up in the wonder of Jesus. Third, as we think about this last area of contrast, this, this is really the most important because this difference is where all the difference happens. Like, this is why Mary relates differently to her culture and what her culture valued. It's why Mary relates differently to herself. And the last area of contra contrast is about where you focus your attention. While Mary was listening to Jesus' teaching, we read in verse 40, but Martha was distracted with much serving. The word distracted is, is a word that means to be pulled away or dragged away. And when Jesus speaks to Martha in verse 41, he, he tells us more of what's going on here. He says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. As one writer on this passage puts it, Martha is engaged in anxious, agitated practices, behavior that contrasts sharply with the way of life of a disciple. And I think it's at least an interesting question to ask why. Maybe why for us? Why, why do we choose busyness and distraction. Recently, I was listening to this really uh, fascinating conversation about Blaise Pascal. He was a Christian, a 17th century philosopher, scientist, mathematician, I mean, just brilliant guy. In his famous work, The Pensees, uh, he writes, 
the only thing that consoles us from our misery is diversion, and yet it is the greatest of our miseries. The only thing that consoles us from our misery is diversion. So what I understand it to be meaning with this conversation that I was listening to was kind of teasing out is there's, there's a lot of hard things in life, right? There are complex and difficult questions like death, God, does my life have any meaning or purpose, who am I? And these questions, they intrude into our lives, and they're not easy to answer, and, and they can make us feel kind of, I don't, I don't like these questions. I feel uncomfortable with these questions. And then there's other things that are just hard in our lives, things that make us feel anxious, things that make us feel sad, the troubled parts of our lives, the broken parts of our lives. And these hard realities and, and intruding questions, they feel like too much. And so we choose diversion, which is to say we choose to be distracted. We choose to be distracted so we don't have to deal with these hard things because we're afraid they're just going to eat away at us. And yet the sad reality is, is because we won't deal with them and we just distract ourselves, it only contributes to a life of surface living, a life without any real depth, without really wrestling with the questions that actually matter. Martha is anxious and troubled by many things. She's busy and distracted. And, and this episode is really fascinating because if you dig more into Luke's gospel, you, what we've seen in Martha and Mary, Jesus has already talked about it. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus tells the parable of the sower. Do you remember that one? It's about the farmer who goes out and he's sowing the seed, which is the word, the gospel, and there's these different soils, and Jesus says the whole thing is about how you hear, whether or not you're hearing the Word or not. And this is the exact phrase to describe what Mary is doing, verse 39. She is sitting at the feet, Jesus' feet, literally it says, she was hearing His Word. And Martha is a good example of that third soil the one who kind of hears, but the anxieties of life. Same word used in Luke 8, 14, as in verse 41 of our passage that Jesus diagnoses Martha with. The, the cares, the troubles, the anxieties of life keep her from really hearing. Which is to say, they keep her from the fruitfulness and the fullness and the wholeness and the healing that comes from taking in the message of the kingdom, of who Jesus is, of what he's come to do. Martha is anxious, and she's troubled, and she's distracted, and she's pulled away from attending to the one that if she would just sit at his feet and listen, she would be healed. Another book in this huge list of books that chronicle the modern problem of distraction, uh, Johann Hari's book, Stolen Focus, he tells this story about a man named Mihaly uh, Csikszentmihalyi. He's a Hungarian-American psychologist. And Ma Mihaly grew up uh, in World War II Europe, and he experienced how few people were able to really cope with the tragedies and experiences of that war. And so he was very interested in understanding what makes a life worth living. And he comes to the U.S. and he studies psychology, and he made this discovery of this thing called flow states. You know what this is if you've ever had the experience where you, know, you are so just immersed in a project or an activity or a book that you like lose track of time and maybe you forget to eat and you look up and you're like, oh my gosh, it's been like four hours. You've been so engrossed in this thing. Well, Mahali had an older brother named Moritz, and at the end of World War II, Moritz was taken into a Stalinist concentration camp in Russia, the kind of place where people don't come back from. But later in life, Moritz reappears, and he's reunited with his brother Mahali, and Harry writes, uh, Hari writes in this book saying, Moritz's ability to find flow had been cut off in the most brutal ways but Mahali discovered that very late in his life, his brother had been able to develop for the first time this flow and pursue something that he loved. He was fascinated by crystals. 
and he began to collect these sparkling rocks. And he would get them from every continent. And he went to the, you know, the conventions and the dealers, and he read magazines about them. And uh, he tells this story about how Mahali goes to Moritz's house, and it's like a museum of crystals from the ceiling to the floor. And Moritz tells Mahali, he hands him this crystal the size of like a child's fist, and he says, yesterday morning at 9 a.m., I pulled out this crystal, and I started looking at it, and I, and I had it under the microscope, and I was turning it round and round, and then, and then I looked out, and I thought a storm must be coming, because it was getting dark, but, but it was 7 o'clock at night. For, for 10 hours, he had just gazed at this crystal, this object of beauty outside of him, and it had captivated him. It had drawn him out of himself. It had given him joy. It had even in some ways healed some of the pain and suffering. Friends, you know where this is going, right? I mean, we have something so much better than a crystal. We have a person. We have Jesus, Jesus, the eternal Son of God, who came into this world for us and for our salvation, the one who created you, the one who you were made to reflect his image and to know and to gaze at him and to be transformed by him, to become like him and to reflect him. What if there was someone that you could sit before and be still before? Someone that you could just be with in your naked, unimpressive, just you self. Someone whose grace and love, whose gentleness and kindness, whose righteous strength and goodness, whose beauty could actually mend you and bring healing and wholeness to your life. I think that's what Mary found. And that's what we're meant to find in Jesus. This leads into the next phase of our community project, Habits for Love. We've spent some time thinking about detox, how to slow down, how to abstain, how to not just be busy. Now we're turning to a time that we're calling Attending to Grace. Starting today in Adult Sunday School, and then in an email that's going to go out Tuesday, uh, we're inviting you to try engaging in practices that will help focus your attention on Jesus. This week, uh, that will be a particular practice of prayer. And the whole point of this way of prayer is to help us process our day in light of God's presence and His goodness and His faithfulness in our lives. If you're anything like me, you know that sometimes you find yourself just rushing through life or just trying to get through life, just trying to get through the day or get through the week, but not actually receiving it like a gift from God. I'd invite you to try this practice of prayer. If you would like to grow in being more present, more your whole self in moments of your day and with people in your life, if you'd like to have a greater awareness of God's grace and presence, more alive to Him and attending to Him throughout the day, more just alive to the reality that God is your environment, like you are in His presence you are united to Jesus if you believe in Him. You are indwelt by the Spirit. If even the possibility of that being more real to you sounds compelling, let me invite you to join with us in this journey and try some of these practices that we'll be doing these next couple weeks. Let me invite us now to turn to God in a time of prayer. Having heard His Word, we now turn to God confessing our sins, confessing those ways this past week where we know that we have not lived loving Him and loving others. Let's spend some time in prayer, and then I will uh, lead us in prayer after a few moments.